name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. This is Timothy S. Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic, joined again, once again, by Dr. Edmund Mazza. Dr. Mazza, how are you doing? Oh, doing well, thank God. Excellent. It's, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for coming on again. Uh, today's topic is Augustine against Luther. He, we are going to make an argument here today that, or Dr. Mazza rather, that he is more or less the preemptive hammer of the Protestants. And we're going to dig into some of his theology and address the fundamental uh, doctrine of the Protestants. Uh, I, might, I might say sola scriptura, but Luther himself was the one who said that sola fide, faith alone, was, I believe the phrase he uses is, it is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. Is that, is that the phrase? Do you recall that? So. Yeah. So th this is the fundamental doctrine, at least according to Luther and many Protestants. Um, so th we're going to address what is the true doctrine of Augustine? What's the true doctrine of the church? Why is Luther wrong? Why are the Protestants wrong? It is a very important topic. So Dr. Maz is going to get into that. But before we do, Everyone make sure that you go below on the links, you go to Dr. Maz's website, you support him. And he also has a class that's coming soon. Dr. Maz, you want to tell us about your class? Sure thing. Yeah. You know, with so many groups running around the country trying to erase our history, uh, this is the time for Catholics to learn their history. It's time to... Um, take a course on church history. So I'm offering a course on church history starting September the 15th, uh, Tuesday, September the 15th. And I'm starting a course on world history uh, starting Wednesday, September 16th. And if uh, folks want to sign up, all they have to do is go to www.edmundmaza.com. We're actually running a special right now. If you uh, sign up for both classes uh, before September 2nd, uh, you get two for four fifty, uh, and if you sign up for one class, it's three hundred. So we're running a really good deal now. And um, really, if you want to learn, I, I was I was tempted to ref to call my courses Jesus Christ the Next Generation, but then I thought that might be irreverent. But really, that's what we're learning because it's it's Jesus who who walks through the centuries uh, using our bodies, so to speak, uh, and and the events of the Gospels are reenacted through time. Uh, so um, I'd be very happy to uh, take any questions that people have. They can comment on the, on the blog post on the website and I hope people will sign up. Yeah. You can spend, you know, $1,500 on a six month credit to get a Marxist education. That's, <laughs> that's going to just brainwash you like all the millennials who are destroying things right now. They spent that amount of money to get brainwashed into Marxist history, or you can get a, get it a lot better deal for the truth instead with Dr. Maza. So make sure you all sign up. Uh, this is a great opportunity to get brushed up on your history. Uh, I, I, I definitely, in my opinion, I think a true history of the church is absolutely fundamental. It really helps us face church the church crisis right now when we when we understand that we our fathers have been through multiple crises, you know, we, we think it's bad right now, but there's so many different instances of our fathers facing terrible, terrible things, armies, plagues, totals, you know, multiple popes, three popes, I mean, right. et cetera, et cetera. I mean, so when you understand that, I think it, it gives us a great, a, a much longer view of history and we can face today. So definitely everybody take a look at Dr. Maza's uh, course. If you can't pay all that, certainly just go to his uh, go fund me and just, uh, chip him. you know, don't, don't buy a Starbucks or whatever. Don't, don't do this. Just give him so, something it, that you can just to support him. Uh, we definitely want to support all our brethren uh, as I make this appeal on this show, pretty much every show to, for the poor people who are in need. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Maza is certainly not impoverished as some, but he is in need and he's really a servant of the church. And so I, I think supporting him is, is a great duty for us as Christians. So without further ado, 
uh, St. Augustine. So today is St. Augustine's feast day. So everybody, happy feast day for St. Augustine. It's also the birthday of my goddaughter. So we'll offer up oh. our father for her, Amelia, as well. Excellent. So, uh, so Dr. Mazza, who is St. Augustine? Tell us about him. Well, he's a saint for our age because he's a sinner turned saint. When he was a young man, he prayed a prayer. I hope none of you ever pray. He said, Lord, grant me the gift of chastity, but not yet. <laughs> so he was a, a diamond in the rough. And of course, uh, on the Novus Ordo calendar yesterday, we celebrated the Feast of St. Monica. And if it wasn't for St. Monica, uh, we, he would not be the great saint that he is today. Uh, she prayed for him. He, you know, he lost his faith. And um, well, let me give you a quick, you know, give the audience a quick uh, bio of him. Uh, he was born in North Africa and his mother, Monica, was a Christian and his father Patricius was a pagan. Uh, and this was at the time when the Roman Empire had just become Christian after you know 20 years of Constantine uh, being in power. He was born in the year 354. And at this time, um, uh, his, you know, his mother tried to be a good Christian influence on him, but he took after his father. His father was not always faithful to St. Monica. And Augustine fell in with a bad crowd and then he went off to college, and of course, it got much worse. <laughs> he he went to uh, the city of Carthage, which in its day was sort of like Vegas. You know, what happens in Carthage stays in Carthage. Uh, and he went there to learn rhetoric. He wanted to be a lawyer, you know, the art of uh, public speaking. And his mother had warned him, now, I don't want you engaging in affairs. You, I want you to go to church every Sunday. He was like, yeah, ma, sure, sure thing. And he, he did keep that promise because he went to church every Sunday because as everybody knows, it's the best place to scope out the ladies. Uh, and one thing led to another. And of course, he started living with his girlfriend. And we learn all of this, by the way, from his, uh, his great work, The Confessions, which, uh, by the way, oh, there it is, <laughs> is the first autobiography basically in Western history. Okay. And um, so he tells us that, you know, I was living with my girlfriend and then we had a child out of wedlock. It wasn't planned, but we decided to have him anyway. Um, and then one thing led to another and he joined a cult, uh, this sort of semi-Christian, semi-Buddhist type thing, uh, which was started by a guy named Mani back in Iran uh, about 100 years before Augustine. So Augustine became a Monachaean uh, and he... Um, Basically, for those that have never heard of this before, basically they were Gnostics, Christian Gnostics, who taught that the flesh is evil, you know, that we, we are living in a material world and I, well, no, that's something else. Uh, everything material is evil, basically. And so Jesus never died on the cross. He never shed his blood. It was all uh, an illusion. It, it's not really him. Uh, and so, and, and by the way, this is going to influence uh, Muhammad, Muhammad later on. Uh, because Muslims do not believe that Jesus uh, died on the cross. But anyway, that's a story for another day. So, um, you know, Monica prayed for Augustine during his wayward uh, time. And she even, you know, went to her bishop and kind of grabbed the bishop by his, his robes and was crying, please, please help my son, help my son. And he was like, woman, a son of this many tears is not going to be lost. Uh, you know, and, and it was true. A son of that many tears was not lost. She was able to obtain the graces for him for conversion. And this happened when he was in the city of Milan. He had left his, uh, uh, his girlfriend, uh, the, the mother of his child, because they could not get married. They were of a different social strata. And his mother had arranged a marriage to him, to an eligible uh, young lady, but she was so young, he had to wait for her to become of marriageable age. And unfortunately for Augustine, he, he couldn't stay celibate for very long, so he took up another mistress. Um, but at the same time, in the city of Milan, because he was interested in rhetoric and the art of public speaking, and I go into this in my course when we, we do Augustine, Augustine was influenced by another saint, St. Ambrose. Ambrose was the most eloquent speaker in Milan, which basically at that time was the imperial capital. And so he would go to the cathedral just to learn the art of public speaking, not because he was interested in his mother's faith. Uh, and, you know, but I think little by little, what he heard from Ambrose in his sermons, it kind of grew on him, you know, inwardly. And then one day he had the, the dramatic break. He, um, 
he he says I was you know me and my roommate we were we were hanging out when we got paid a visit by a guy named I think his name was Pontancianos, and he used to work in Special Branch. He was basically like a James Bond kind of figure. You know, he used to work in the Secret Service with the Emperor, but he left that. Him and a friend of his they left that all behind when they heard the story of Saint Anthony, the hermit in Egypt, and. Long story short, Anthony was this sort of wealthy orphan, and then he gave away all his wealth and lived as a hermit in the Egyptian desert. And he lived to the ripe old age of like 110. Uh, and he was really the founder of monasticism. And so Pantanchianus was relating this story to Augustine, and Augustine was listening to this, and it boggled his mind how, you know, I can't be celibate for 10 minutes, and here this guy was 110 years old and was celibate, and fasting and praying. and so Augustine removed himself, went into the backyard, and he tells us in the confessions, I heard these kids playing next door, and they were doing a, some, kind of, some kind of sing song. They were singing, to le le, gay, to le le, gay, to le le. And he's like, wait a minute. In Latin, that means pick it up and read. And he says, wait a minute. I never heard, I never played a game like that when I was a kid, pick it up and read. And what should be on the, uh, you know, the, the table in front of him, but the letters of St. Paul. So he, he basically picked up St. Paul, and his finger hit. He began to read the first page that his finger landed on, and he was blown away, right? Because it was from Romans, where I, I, don't, I forget which chapter and verse, but basically it's the verse that says, uh, not in uh, sexual uh, orgies and not in drunkenness and partying, but put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. And he was like cut to the core and he began sobbing. He began weeping and he repented of all his sins and he gave himself over to the Lord Jesus in that moment of grace. And of course he was baptized by St. Augustine and St. Monica was able to die a happy woman, but that's not the end of the story. St. Augustine goes on to become not only a, a priest, he goes on to become a bishop of the city of Hippo Regius in North Africa. And of course, St. Augustine was, after St. Paul, he's the greatest theologian of the first thousand years of the church. And I mean, that's something even you know Protestants and Catholics can agree on. Um, and uh, he had to deal with so many different heresies, uh, not only the Manichaeans of his past, but the Pelagians and the Donatists. Uh, and he had to deal with the barbarians. Uh, and I hope before the end of the show, we can talk a little bit about um, his city of God and the sack of Rome. And um, so he's, he's famous for the confessions. He's famous for the city of God. He wrote five million words without a typewriter or a PC. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my, my hat's off to him, uh, quite literally, uh, on that. And, of course, he's, he's just this wonderful saint. And what's so wonderful about St. Augustine is that he is thoroughly Catholic, uh, we're, I hope we're going to go through some very juicy quotes today, <laughs> proving that in you know the fourth century, uh, here's this solid, solid witness to the uh, you know these doctrines of the church, which have have always been there since the get go. Yeah, uh, I've I think I believe it's Yaroslav Pelikan, the Lutheran scholar, very erudite though. Um, I believe he was the one who said that all of the Western tradition is just footnotes of Augustine. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Brenda Definitely. Mother? Yeah, there's an old expression that all of philosophy is a, is a footnote to Plato, which is interesting because St. Augustine got away from his Manichaeanism uh, and embraced uh, Neoplatonism for a while. And he, and he found some commonality between Plato and um, the, the Christian message. Uh, but ultimately, he needed the grace of God uh, in order to achieve union with the one. Uh, which is something that the Platonists would do, but the Platonists thought that you know it, it, you have to, only individual philosophers might be able to create union with the divine, but not the average schlep on the street. You see, mm -hmm. so um, so Saint Augustine had in sort of an intellectual evolution uh, in his thought, uh, but yeah, uh, I, and and actually Yaroslav Pelikan uh, had an intellectual journey, right? Because he, he starts out as Lutheran and then ends up as, as Orthodox, right? Yeah, he did convert to Eastern Orthodoxy at the end of his life. But his his five, I think, his five volume set history of doctrine is is superb. Mm -hmm. um, the now and one more question before we get into more of the topic. Sure. Uh, but but once again, everyone needs to go 
if you haven't read the confessions, there's really no other book in history. That's really like this book. It's yes, it's an autobiography, but it's, a, it's, I mean, it's an autobiography unlike any other because most of the, most of the book really is him talking to God directly. And it's just basically his prayer about his life. That's I, I, this is, this is the book that converted me from Protestantism when I, when I first read it. And it's really remarkable, incredible. Um, like you said, 5 million words. I don't know what, um, how that compares to the, the next most prolific church father, but, uh, <laughs> I'm quite sure it's, it's, he's out, he's in another ballpark in terms of yeah. how much he really wrote. Um, the, what I would, so I was, what I was going to ask you is that my understanding of the Western, uh, doctrinal tradition is that, so St. Thomas Aquinas, who we can call as the best, best theologian of the second millennium, right? He, he, so he adopts an Aristotle. And so the, the two streams that are happening during the, uh, 1200s, the glorious 13th century are really the Augustinians represented in the Franciscan tradition in more of mm -hmm. a Platonistic idea, uh, which Platonism is, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it, it um, basically starts with the, the abstract and comes down to the concrete, whereas the Aristotle philosophically starts with the concrete and goes to the abstract. Like and then, uh, Ra Raphael's uh, painting in, this, in the, the papal apartments, the School of Athens. Uh, uh, Plato, Plato was pointing up and uh, Aristotle is kind of pointing in the middle here. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah I didn't, didn't know that connection, yep. but w would you say that's kind of the two main streams and the, the Dominicans with Aquinas sort of are the dominant and mm -hmm. they continue to be, but uh, Aquinas uses Augustine all over. I mean, he's Augustine yeah. uses authority, but it's kind of through Aristotle. Yeah. Would I was going to say, um, uh, people don't realize, I mean, of course uh, it's only at the time of St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, that the thought of Aristotle became available to Western scholars. And uh, fortunately, that's just when the universities were getting started in Europe. Uh, and but um, so uh, now up to that point, uh, they had known Plato via people like Augustine. But that being said, um, I think if you did a, a word search of Thomas Aquinas, I, I don't think he quotes anybody more than Augustine. Uh, I think he, you know, it's pretty, pretty even uh, between him and Aristotle after, of course, the Bible is first, but um, and, and I'm sure that there's a, a book that came out recently about Augustine in Aquinas. So there's actually a lot more Augustine in there than people think, but uh, yeah, generally speaking, it was the Franciscans who sort of took the uh, Augustinian Platonic approach to things and the Dominicans who took the, obviously the Aristotelian Thomistic approach to things. So the other thing that Augustine does is he founds the first Western monastic order, in fact, the Augustinians. And it just so happens that a monk joins that Augustinian order in the 1500s, Martin Luther. So Martin Luther yeah. is an Augustinian monk when he begins to propagate his errors. So before we get to Luther, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to start? Well, where do you want to go with this? Now we can talk about Augustine against <laughs> Luther. Um, we've got to just, you can let, let me know which quotes you want to bring up, but sure. tell us about Augustine's uh, struggle with Pelagianism. How did he develop? What is his doctrine? Tell us about that. Well, you know, somebody asked me recently why it is that uh, Protestants uh, have an affinity for Augustine if he's so Catholic. Uh, and, and my off the cuff answer was perhaps it's because he's the doctor of grace and because he wrestled with the writings of a guy named Pelagius. Now, who's Pelagius? He's actually the earliest British author that we have on record. And he was a Christian, but he had this doctrine that Adam and Eve don't transmit to us original sin, you know, metaphysically or biologically. Um, they just gave us a bad example. That was sort of Pelagius's take on fallen human nature. And uh, basically, he, he, he almost argued, if you want to just encapsulate it in one sentence, that we can kind of save ourselves. It's basically what Protestants accuse Catholics of doing, just, you know, salvation by works or justification by works alone, <laughs> uh, that somehow if you just lead a good life, you can get to heaven. And Augustine 
just knew that that's a bunch of malarkey because Augustine had been, you know, had been down in the gutter and knew what it was to be selfish and lustful and all of all the nine yards, right? So Augustine knew that it's only by the grace of God that he escaped eternal punishment and, 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 and came to the light and came to the truth. So uh, Augustine and Pelagius have sort of have this back and forth, you see. Um, and uh, maybe this is a good, you know, jumping off point to sort of get into uh, Augustine versus Luther, because Luther took uh, sort of the opposite view of Pelagius. Luther taught that human nature has been so vitiated by original sin that basically him and Calvin said that, you know, we're completely depraved. Uh, our intellect and our will. There's this famous exchange between Luther and Erasmus of Rotterdam. Desiderius Erasmus uh, over free will, and it, and it, there's there's a certain point in that dialogue where Luther says to Erasmus, "Now, my dear Erasmus, you said that you would give in to him who had the better argument. Now, I must commend you on this one point. Other people have, you know, persecuted me regarding purgatory, the papacy, uh, indulgences, and Luther says mere trifles." But you have hit the central issue, Erasmus, the slavery of the will. So for Luther, his whole doctrine hinged on the fact that we don't have free will. That's why Luther said, sin and sin boldly, but believe more boldly still. I'm thinking of having a t-shirt made. <laughs> anyway, uh, so of course you can't keep the commandments if you don't have free will. You see, and so Luther was terribly worried about his salvation, and ultimately he read Romans chapter one, and came to the conclusion that the righteousness of God is not the righteousness with which He judges the unrighteous sinner. The righteousness of God is that which the the good God clothes the unrighteous and makes us righteous, even though we're really not. You see, so Luther. Uh, of course, is famous for his uh, sola fide, we're saved by faith alone and not by works of the law, which again, he's he's quoting uh, St. Paul, and we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty about that. But uh, so the essence of Luther's argument is that human nature is totally evil, and we're only saved by grace, we're only saved by faith, and we don't have anything to do with our own salvation. Now, this is basically the polar opposite of Pelagius. Does that make sense? Yeah, and and uh, one of uh, the commenters in the in the show. So you you're saying that uh, could you explain how if Luther says grace is sufficient, does he say that it, it's forced upon you? Is there any freedom for the will in Luther? There is no freedom of the will in Luther. Luther is famous for saying, "My will, my will is a jackass." If God rides me, I go where God wants me to go. <laughs> if, if the devil rides me, I go where the devil wants me to go. <laughs> I won't. I won't. No more outbursts for the rest. Yeah, of that the was episode. the. Uh, well, no, that was that was very fitting because Luther was famous for his insults and outbursts. Yes. Uh, there, I think there's still a website online where it says it's like Luther insults, and you can just oh, click click for an insult, and it gives you an an insult from Luther. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know he, he he mocks Erasmus as saying his his arguments are are dung, and he just laughs at him. And uh, yeah, he, yeah, he was a piece of work. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I, I wanted to recommend that this is the the volume that has Erasmus and Luther, Erasmus and then Luther responding. Um, oh, excellent! And that's that has both those works in it. But yeah, the there is really is no freedom. The understanding with Luther and Kelvin is that God puts people in hell or heaven. And that's that again, kicking and screaming. Yeah. You know, as I said before with Luther, it's I'm worried about salvation. And his answer is don't be worried about it because unless you apostatize from the faith and, you know, become an atheist or a Muslim or a Buddhist, you're saved. Um, in fact, let me give you a good quote from Luther. Um, which basically sums up his whole doctrine in one paragraph, short paragraph. This is from the Babylonian captivity of the church. 
and this is from 1520, so this is fairly early. See how rich, therefore, is a Christian, the one who is baptized. Even if he wants to, he cannot lose his salvation, however much he sin, unless he will not believe. For no sin can condemn him except unbelief alone. All other sins, so long as the faith in God's promise made in baptism returns or remains, all other sins, I say, are immediately blotted out through that same faith, or rather through the truth of God, because he cannot deny himself. So that, that, that's Luther right there. Um, and if you'd like, we could then now talk about Augustine's response to that or a thousand years earlier. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the the big, I, I mean, the big question is, well, why is faith not a work? I mean, aren't you working when you have faith? <laughs> well, you know, as Catholics, we do believe that faith and hope and charity are theological virtues, which means we don't generate them. It's not like we can work ourselves up. Oh, I'm going to have faith now. No, it's totally a gift from God that we cannot earn. Uh, I mean, we can try to prepare the groundwork for it, but there's nothing we can do to earn it. That The Protestants have that right. I mean, it is a theological virtue. Therefore, it's, it's a total gift. It's totally given freely. In fact, Augustine uh, says here, uh, now, this is interesting. So a thousand years before Luther, Augustine wrote something called On Grace and Free Will. And, and he makes it clear. He says, Augustine says, God's grace is not given according to our merits. Period. You know, end of story there. Uh, that being said, of course, Augustine is going to teach something very different than, than Luther. Here, let me get that quote if you want to go over that. Let's see. The one I just uh, yeah, I've got that one. Let's see. So yeah, you want to go over that, Doctor Mazza? Grace is not given according to our merits. Yeah, he says um, the truth is we see that it is given not only where there are no good, but even when there are many evil merits proceeding. In other words, um, Saint Paul. God gave St. Paul the grace of conversion when St. Paul was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians, you see? Um, and, and scripture says that, you know, he loved us even when we were enemies, right? So um, that's where Augustine is coming from. And so that much the Catholics and the Protestants can agree upon. But where Catholics and Protestants differ, of course, is that uh, we do have a definition, a different definition of faith, uh, and we do include works in this. So let me uh, jump down on my page here and see if I can find a good, a good quote on this from, um, from Augustine to kind of to jump into this. Um, so Augustine, um, I want to jump to the part where Augustine t is sort of commenting on um, our Lord's discourse at the Last Supper. What's the phrase in that uh, section? He says here, um, it's, it's, shall we say that one is doing greater works? I think it's on the second or third page I sent you. Shall we say that one is doing greater works? Okay, go ahead. You got it? Okay. Yep. So here's the thing. Um, if, if somebody is, you know, watching the show and wants to follow along, um, if you, Turn to our Lord's discourse in, in St. John's Gospel at the Last Supper. Really, what we are about to explain right now is, is the essence of how Catholicism differs from Protestantism. And you might want to send this video to your Protestant friends because I'm going to break down for you, Timothy and I are going to break down for you, what the Catholic view on salvation is and how scriptural it actually is. Okay, So in John 14... Um, uh, Philip t says to our Lord at the Last Supper, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. And Jesus says to him, Philip, have I been with you so long? And you say, show us the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? 
And the words that I speak to you, I don't speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works because I go to my father. Now, we could ask ourselves, how is it possible for us to do greater works than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, that's what St. Augustine was trying to, to, to figure out. And so St. Augustine, on his uh, tractate on John, uh, I think it's chapter 72 or book 72, he says this, he's quoting our Lord, and greater works than these shall he do. And St. Augustine says, then what, I ask? Shall we say that one is doing greater works than all that Christ did, who is working out his own salvation with fear and trembling? A work which Christ is certainly working in him, but not without him. You see, Luther would never say that. Luther would say, Christ is working in you, but he would, he would never say, but not without you, without your participation. And St. Augustine continues, and one which I might without hesitation call greater than the heavens and the earth and all in both within the compass of our vision. For heaven and earth will pass away, but the salvation and justification of those predestined thereto shall continue forever. Now, the point that Augustine is trying to make here, and if anybody's lost their way, we, we'll, we'll make this very clear in a second. Listen to what St. Augustine says. He says, the creation of heaven and the angels, they're all the work of Christ. Is it then greater works also than these that a Christian does who, with Christ working in him, is a co-worker in his own eternal salvation and justification? And it is assuredly something less to preach the words of righteousness, which Jesus did apart from us, than to justify the ungodly, which he does in such a way in us that we are also doing it ourselves. So, um, Timothy, for you and for the readers, the listeners, this is exactly what the Council of Trent taught in, in opposition to Luther, right? Right. Uh, you, you'd never hear a Protestant pronounce the, the, the words, I'm a co-worker in my own salvation. But a thousand years before Luther, this is what St. Augustine says. And the term co-worker, that very term is the term used by St. Paul. Sun ergos, that I'm working with. Yeah, St. Augustine, a little earlier on, um, let's see if we can find the quote to, to sort of back this up. He says, uh, let me get the inch pit for you. Uh, this is the second paragraph on the first page I sent you. It starts out with, um, now there was a decided merit in, Got it. in the Apostle Paul. But it was an evil one while he persecuted the church. And he says of it, I am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And then um, uh, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And St. Augustine unpacks this. Then in order to exhibit also his free will, he added in the next clause, and his grace within me was not in vain, but I have worked more abundantly than they all. This free will of man, he appeals to in the case of others also, as when he says to them, we beg you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Second Corinthians chapter six. Now, how could he so enjoin them if they received God's grace in such a manner as to lose their own will? 
And so again, Luther, uh, Augustine is countering Luther here because Luther said, we don't have free will whatsoever. And Augustine says, no, we have free will. And Paul is saying we have free will. And at the very end, um, uh, he quotes, uh, Paul is saying, not I alone, but the grace of God with me. And, and, and Augustine comments, and thus neither was it the grace of God alone, which is Luther's position, nor was it he himself alone, which is Pelagius's position, but it was the grace of God with him. Uh, we translate it in, in, as co, right? In, when we read the letters of Paul, co-heirs, right? That I forget which, uh, which epistle that is. Excellent. Um, so what did Luther do? Tell us about Romans 3, 28. Okay, so bring let's, um, let's bring up Romans 3, 28 here. And this is, um, okay, so uh, Augustine, and really Augustine, when he, when he brings up this quote, he's really paraphrasing um, St. Peter. Um, St. Peter, in, chap in 2 Peter uh, chapter 10, I believe, um, Peter writes, Our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable <laughs> twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Uh, now, this again flies in the face of Luther. Because when you study Luther, Luther said the Bible is clear. You open the Bible and you understand it. There, there's no need for interpretation. That's I, I forget the the may, Timothy. Maybe you remember the exact phrase for this in Protestantism. What well, you mean? Uh, the clarity of Scripture or yeah, sola that script, scriptura? That Scripture is self-evident. That you just. You open yeah. it up and it's clear as day, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the the term okay. is. I know he goes over that in Bondage of the Will. He basically okay. just says it's it's clear as day. You don't need all the church fathers to interpret it. Exactly. So that was that was Luther's opinion, but he's contradicting what what the first pope, right, Saint Peter, says in Second Peter. Now, uh, Augustine, Augustine writes the following. He says, uh, and again, he's speaking in the same vein as Peter. Unintelligent persons, however. With regard to the Apostle Paul's statement, and this is Romans chapter 3, verse 28, quote, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the works of the law. Um, and, and again, Augustine says, unintelligent people have thought him to mean that faith suffices to a man even if he lead a bad life and has no good works. Now, that this means that according to Augustine, Luther is terribly ignorant <laughs> because that was precisely what Luther said. Luther said, sin and sin boldly, but believe more boldly still because you're saved by faith, not by works. So if Augustine had been around, he would have told Luther, you're out to lunch, okay? Um, Augustine says, impossible, it's impossible that such a character could be deemed a vessel of election by Paul, who, after declaring that in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, adds at once, but faith which works by love. And Augustine explains this, and this is important for people to listen to, because this is the definition of faith that Catholics, uh, especially the Council of Trent, go by okay uh, the, the catholic understanding of faith is faith which worketh by love or shows itself in works of love works of charity this is galatians chapter 5 verse 6 i mean catholics don't proof text but if we did that would be the you know the catholic proof text for justification by faith and works um augustine continues uh he says that you know the demons have faith. Uh, they believe and tremble. That's what James says, uh, chapter two, verse nineteen. But they do not do well. Therefore, they possess not the faith by which the just man lives. 
the faith which works by love in such a way that God rewards it according to its works with eternal life. Again, no self-respecting Protestant would ever make that statement. And yet that is the Catholic statement of St. Augustine, the correct interpretation of Paul and of James. Uh, it's, it's extremely telling when you ask a Protestant, they say they follow the Bible. Well, where in the Bible does it say faith alone? There is one instance where it does <laughs> say faith right. alone, and it actually says not faith alone. That's exactly. the only instance that says faith alone. It says not faith alone. How much more obvious can you get? And and this this passage was so funny because it's something that I bring up in my book on the Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. This very text, Romans 3.28, when Luther was translating this into German, he added the word alone into that's this right. text, into his German text. That's that's how much reverence he had for the Holy Scriptures. He thinks he follows the Scriptures. Well, he he concluded, he, he wrote this verse, he added the word, we conclude that a man is justified by faith. I think I'll just add the word alone here, because clearly St. Paul was trying to teach my doctrine. <laughs> so he well, added you know, the word alone. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, again, I could, uh, uh, if, you, if, if you wanted to, we could get into a little bit more about how Luther uh, messed with the Bible. Uh, <laughs> because he, he says somewhere that... Uh, how did he phrase it? About the book of Revelation. He said, uh, when I read it, I feel a personal aversion to it. And for me, this is sufficient reason for rejecting it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, was a, to, I was trying to find the reference to that. He, he just mocks uh, St. James. And he, uh, I have the reference up here in my book. I yeah, an epistle of straw, old yeah. Jimmy. Uh, I don't believe that he wrote it. It's an epistle of straw. Um, and of course you got to ask yourself, well, why didn't he, uh, like James? And as you point out, the reason is because the only time faith alone shows up in the Bible is when James says, condemns it and says, we're not justified by faith alone. Um, yeah, here's, the, course, here, here's the quote here. It says, mm -hmm. Luther says, quote, I will not have him in my Bible End quote. That's from preface to James and Jude in, uh, the, the Martin Luther Verk Deutsch Bible. <laughs> Uh, six, ten, three, thirty-four, etc. <laughs> yeah, and 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 he won't have uh, what's the other um, uh, in the book of Re the reason why he's so against the book of Revelation is because I forget what chapter and verse it is, but there's a part of the, of of it where it says that um, uh, John saw a vision of of of, of hell, and, and and he said no, no, no. He how was it again? The sea gave up its dead. And those oh. that were were saved uh, were saved by their works or something along right. those lines. Those who had done evil to eternal damnation. Those who had done good to everlasting life, as the Lord the Lord Himself says. Exactly. So uh, again, anything that, that that went against Luther's own you know personal idiosyncratic idea, it was not the script. It was not the Word of God. <laughs> and th there's a very important point that I bring out in my book is that there's a there's a a controversial movement among Protestants to this day, which is called the new perspective on Paul. And this is something that is popular among, uh, with a scholar named Entine Wright. He's a, an Anglican and others such as like him, okay. which is very controversial among Protestants. And they basically they're, they're actually using the historical critical method. They're just digging into the history and they're realizing what they're arguing is that Luther did not understand this text, Romans 3.28 and all other work, all other texts where St. Paul talks about works because what they point out, and these are Protestants talking here, they point out that what St. Paul's really talking about is works of the law, meaning right. the mitzvot of the Torah, the, the commandments of Moses, i.e. circumcision, Sabbath keeping, festival keeping, et cetera, et cetera. That right is what he's talking about works of the law. He's not talking about good works in general. He's talking about works yeah. of the law because he's addressing the Judaizing heresy. And this is something you can bring up to Protestants. You can say, well, why do you, why do Protestants even admit the, the new perspective on Paul admits that Luther completely misunderstood Romans 3.28? Yeah, and, and there's a Catholic scholar, uh, you, you might've read him, uh, John, I think his name is Bergsma. Um, he teaches at Steubenville and, um, He's an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and apparently the only other place in ancient literature where the expression works of the law shows up besides Paul 
is in one of those texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls, from Qumran, right? The um, uh, those you know Jewish sort of monks that live there and were commenting on scripture and whatnot. And Bergsma explains that it, it gives a list of what what works of the law is, and it's about like not letting dogs into the into the sacred precincts and all this kind of weird stuff. That's all, you know. what I'm trying to say it's it's the ceremonial aspects of the law. It's got nothing to do with, you know, the Ten Commandments, for example. Yeah, that, that's a subject that we're, I will actually be covering that very ex exact subject in, in <laughs> one of my Bible series and the, the works of the law and the different aspects, ceremonial, natural, divine. Um, oh, great. Yeah, that's, it's, this is, this is the fundamental aspect because you can even pick up, especially Protestant Bibles, you can pick it up and you can, you can even get the impression that the Protestant doctrine is true. If you read it completely out of context, you don't understand that St. Paul is arguing against the, those who say that you must observe the law of Moses and be circumcised in order to be saved. That's what he's arguing against. Right. Um, tell us about Dr. Maza, the, there is, this is goes into the Protestant notion of extrinsic justification. Can you com, com, contrast that with the Catholic doctrine? How, how are we justified extrinsic intrigues? How does that work? So again, again, if, if, if a Catholic is listening, you might want to send this to your Protestant friends. Again, it goes back to John chapter 14 and John chapter 15. In John 15, our Lord says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Uh, now, when our Lord says bears much fruit, what he means is does good works, does works which he will reward us with in heaven. You see, but we can't do the works if we're not plugged into him, just like a branch that's cut off from the vine just withers up and dies but if you're plugged into christ it's like christ is doing is doing the work through you just like he said um, in chapter 14 of john um it's my father in me who does the works so just like it was the father in jesus who did jesus's works and yet we still say jesus raised lazarus from the dead jesus saved us from our sins the same way the father dwelt in him and did the works through baptism, Jesus dwells in us and does the works through us. But we can still say, you know, Timothy Gordon walked an old lady across the street. Um, so, I'm um, excuse me, Timothy Flanders <laughs> or Timothy Gordon, whoever. <laughs> Any Timothy. <laughs> Any Timothy. Uh, so, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now that's hell, right? If you die as a branch that is separated from the vine, which is Christ, you're just burned in hell forever. And our Lord goes on to say, by this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So will you be my disciples, meaning by doing works, by doing salvific works, uh, and this is what uh, the Council of Trent says on this. Um, if anyone says that the justified person by the good works which he performs through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, right, vine and branches, whoever says that this person does not truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and the attainment of that eternal life let him be anathema. So that was the response of Trent to um, uh, to Calvin and to Luther and to the Protestants who, who misunderstood the mystical body of Christ. Everything that Jesus does has infinite value. And if it's him doing the works through us, we're the, we're the co-workers, but of course the, the junior partner in that, Still, he said, by this is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. And of course, our Lord also says in that parable in John 15, that if you bear fruit, do you remember what he says will happen to you? He says, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. 
you lose grace, right? We would, as Catholics, we would say, <clears throat> we've lost sanctifying grace by our sins. And then our Lord says, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. Now, <clears throat> uh, maybe people can sign the petition that I'm going to create to change the name of purgatory to prunatory. <laughs> The Protestants will get it. Just change the word. Yeah, yeah, they'll get it then. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. That's pruning. That's purgatory. That's purg prunatory. Okay. Uh, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And by the way, this gets us into, um, uh, if you want to talk about Augustine, on indulgences uh, uh we could we could and we could talk about that too if you'd like it at, at this juncture or later oh I, I wanted to jump in on the one of my favorite quotes about this is because i what i love about this is that and this is something i think that is a good way to catch protestants by saying the catholic doctrine is about union with jesus christ true union whereas the protestant doctrine is about an extrinsic law court where just God just declares you innocent. It's not really a union, which is a true union, both in the sacrament of the blessed sacrament itself through a physical sacramental union, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a spiritual union where Christ is truly working within you as St. Paul himself says. Uh, I love this. This is from on grace and free will chapter 15. I mm -hmm. love this. What he says here, uh -huh. he says, it is his own gifts that God crowns, not your merits. He says, uh, the, in accordance with which John also, the Lord's former order, declares, a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. From heaven, of course, because from thence came also the Holy Ghost. When Jesus is at not high, and he says, if then your good merits are God's gifts, God does not crown your merits as your merits, but as his own gifts. And so when we say that we are rewarded in eternal life, God himself is the one who is causing that grace within us. Right. And then rewarding his own gift to us. It is it is an entirely a, a work of grace, both the beginning of salvation when we first have any sort of inkling at all to grace, any sort of inkling to salvation or repentance of any kind. That is an act of grace. That's that's God working. The entire salvation process is God working. And then final perseverance and eternal life. It's God rewarding his own grace that has been given to you. Right. All of which without destroying your free will, without forcing you. And that's the mystery. So I love what he says there. Um, so what, tell me about your, uh, tell me about how, how does it involve indulgences? So um, uh, Augustine, let me pull up the quote here. Again, it has to do with this idea of pruning uh, that God will prune us. Augustine says, temporal punishments, what we would call pruning, are suffered by some in this life only, by some after death, and by some both here and hereafter. Again, remember this. This is St. Augustine living in the 4th century, <laughs> And he's basically talking about purgatory, that some people will get their purgatory here, you know, and then go straight to heaven when they die, like Mother Teresa. <laughs> um, uh, some people uh, will, will do their purgatory um, after they die, but all of them will, will be purged before they reach that last and strictest judgment. But this is what St. Augustine says, but not all who suffer temporal punishments after death will come to eternal punishments, which are to follow after that judgment. The prayer either of the church herself or of pious individuals is heard on behalf of certain of the dead, but it is heard for those who having been regenerated in Christ did not for the rest of their life in the body do such wickedness that they, that they might be judged unworthy of such mercy, nor who have yet lived so well that it might be supposed that they have no need 
of such mercy. Does that make what, sense? And what's the source on that one? That is from the City of God, uh, chapter 21, verse 13. So again, this is the church uh, uh, militant praying and offering the mass, right, for the church suffering in purgatory, except without using the actual uh, without using the actual word purgatory. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, so um, again, the what the Catholic Church teaches, she's taught it in in every century since since you know since Pentecost, since our Lord was on Earth uh, teaching the apostles. Can you tell us about what is the Catholic doctrine of predestination? Sure. So here's the thing. Um, let me pull up, by way of contrast, let me bring up uh, Calvin. So John Calvin obviously agreed with Luther that um, we are saved by faith alone and not by works. But just as, uh, just, just as, uh, right, so remember I said before, Luther is worried about his salvation. And Luther's answer is, don't worry, sin can never sever us from God, right? Uh, as long as you have faith, you can do the most wicked things. And as long as you don't apostatize, you'll be, you'll be saved. Calvin was worried about his salvation, but Calvin's answer is, don't worry, God has already decided who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. Before he made the universe, he already decided it. Can you worry about something that's already done? I mean, the decision's been made already. Um, and he explains this in his uh, most famous work, which is the uh, Institutes of Christian Religion, which uh, Calvin wrote. Calvin, of course, was the younger contemporary of Luther. Um, and by the way, in the spring, I'll be going all over Luther and Calvin in my Church History 102, <laughs> for those that want to take the spring semester with me. All right, Institutes chapter three. This is what Calvin says on predestination. We say then that scripture clearly proves this much, that God by his eternal and immutable counsel determined once for all those whom it was his pleasure one day to admit to salvation and those whom on the other hand, it was his pleasure to doom to destruction. We maintain that this counsel, as regards the elect, is founded on his free mercy, without any respect to human worth, while those whom he dooms to destruction are excluded from access to life by a just and blameless, but at the same time, incomprehensible judgment. So that is the sort of terrifying Calvinistic doctrine of predestination, where you and I could already be condemned to hell and there's nothing we could ever do about it. Yeah, God forces you kicking and screaming to heaven. He forces you kicking and screaming to hell, period. Now this flies in the face of 1 Timothy um, chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, where uh, scripture says, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. So Catholics, again, we don't proof text, but if we did, that's what, that's, that's what we would point to there. Now, there is such a thing as the Catholic doctrine of predestination because St. Paul does say, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, those whom he loved, he, he first foreknew or he foreordained, right? Um, like our Blessed Lady, right? Uh, the fact that she was immaculately conceived is sort of an example of Catholic predestination. That you know, God from all eternity um, chose to grace Our Lady in that very special way. In fact, since we're, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose our topic. But since the subject just came up, let me just quickly uh, give you what Saint Augustine had to say about the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. He says, um, having accepted the Holy Virgin Mary concerning whom on account of the honor of the Lord, I wish to have absolutely no question when treating of sins. 
For how do we know what abundance of grace for the total overcoming of sin was conferred upon her who merited to conceive and bear him in whom there was no sin? So I say, with the exception of the virgin, if we could have gathered together all those holy men and women when they were living here and had asked them whether they were without sin, what do we suppose would have been their answer? Well, anyway, so St. Augustine believed that Mary uh, was sinless. But to get back to this notion of the Catholic notion of predestination, it's not the kind of predestination that, that Calvin is preaching here. We have to hold both things at the same time. One, yes, the Lord, see, it's what you said earlier or what we said earlier. If you and I do any good thing, it's it's because God first acted on us by his grace or, or by his actual, I guess as Catholics, we would call it actual graces, right? Uh, so before we can begin to do anything good, God sort of has to activate us with grace. Um, but he doesn't give equal graces to everybody. Um, Father, Father Gary Gu Lagrange uh, has a good book on this. I don't know, Timothy, have you ever read his book on predestination? No, I have not, just mainly the spiritual life okay. or the, uh, the, his spiritual work. I've read parts of it. And, and basically, Father Gary Gu Lagrange, the, the, the great Thomist of the 20th century, he tries to explain the Catholic notion of predestination. And what he says is, is that you know, God does not distribute his graces um, equally to everybody. And so in a certain sense, it seems as though God sort of plays favorites because he lavishes more graces on certain people. But he doesn't do it because he foresees the good things that they're going to do. Because then, in a certain sense, you'd be earning the grace. Anyway, it, it, obviously, we're in very deep waters here. But the, the point of it is, is that Augustine does talk about election and predestination. But Augustine still believed in free will, and so does the Catholic Church. So on the one hand, we believe in election and predestination. On the other hand, we, we still hold that those who go to hell freely do so. And those that go to heaven... Uh, because they cooperated with the grace of God once it was given to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, we, we would distinguish between the Catholic predestination to heaven, which is a work of God with which we participate by God's grace. Our will is even strengthened to even will. We can't even will that unless we have God's grace. Um, whereas the Calvinistic doctrine is double predestination. You're predestined to heaven and you're also predestined to hell. So no matter what you do, you are damned to hell or you go to heaven kicking and screaming. There's no free will. Um, that is the, that is the doctrine. Um, I want to get to a number of questions here um, that sure. our viewers, let me try to get back to everybody. If, if I miss your question, by the way, please just ask it again. Uh, we've got a number of different question. Um, is this on this subject, um, Snowy says, what's the meaning of if your name is written in the book of life? Is that what we're getting at here, Dr. Mazza? Yeah, that would be the Catholic understanding of predestination. Yeah. Excellent. Sean's asking, can you avoid hell or purgatory by suffering in life? What's Augustine's answer? Yes, I think in that quote that I just had before, uh, it, it is possible, if, you know, ideally, we should do our purgatory here uh, rather than in the next life. Um, uh, so yeah, the Augustine would say that we ideally we would get it done here and just enter into eternal bliss when we die. Right. Yeah. Purgatory is a spectrum. It's really just now or later. You can get all the purgatory done now and go straight to heaven, or you can. Uh, it's it's up to you, but don't have presumption about your. Right. Like, like I mean, what this is the big this is the big thing is that even Protestant historians will admit that morals declined after the Protestant Reformation. And Even why? Luther Does it, yeah. doesn't Luther say I, yeah, before? Pretty, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but I, I do remember reading that. And and why wouldn't it? Because Luther, his doctrine said that it doesn't matter what you do. Period. Just just believe, and that's it. And this gets into yeah. another uh, important aspect of this that we didn't even bring up. But um, have you read E. Michael Jones's treatment of Luther at the end of Degenerate Moderns? Yes, I have. Uh, so there, that was. Mm -hmm. What do you make? What do you make? Because. Just for the viewers, Dr. Jones, basically, he brings up a number of texts, which are not really often talked about, especially there's a Greek text where Melanchthon is, is Luther's cohort. He writes in Greek, which is strange, 
to to complain of Luther's buffoonery and how he's with the ladies and whatnot. And and this is something that had been, was happening among the reformers. They were all breaking their their vows to chastity. They were all getting married. They were trafficking in nuns. They were doing all sorts of debauchery. Luther's own prince, who was his protector, committed bigamy. He married two women. Right. So what what do you make of because Dr. Jones basically argues that justification by faith alone was his way of trying to justify his own sexual sins. What do you yeah, think of that? You know, I I think that there's a lot to psychoanalyze in Luther. Maybe maybe we should do a special show on October 31st uh, where where we, <laughs> we delve yeah. where we where we delve into Luther. But yeah, so two things. E. Michael Jones has his finger on it uh, when he talks about how uh, you know Luther wanted license to engage in sexual sin. And, and uh, so it opened up Pandora's box. So he, he basically developed a theology to, to suit his morality, which as Bishop Sheen says, if you don't live what you believe, uh, you'll begin to believe what you live. <laughs> uh, and, and another thing with Luther is that his, his father apparently was quite, uh, quite oppressive over him. Uh, and whatever Luther did, it wasn't good enough to please his father. Uh, his father was very his father was very upset when he joined the monastery, uh, and, and he said, "What will what will happen to your mother and I? Who's going to look after us?" And Luther was like, "Well, I can pray for you as a monk." And, and his father told him, uh, "Don't you remember it says honor your father and your mother?" And and you better you better. He's a well, father. I had to. I prayed to Saint Anne. She got me out of the lightning storm. I had to become a monk, right? And he says, "You better pray that wasn't a, a delusion of the devil." So there's this. There there is a theory. Uh, uh, Ken Hensley, uh, the, the Catholic apologist, and before him, other people have brought this up. That uh, if you psychoanalyze Luther, this whole idea that you can't please your father is is might might be the genesis for justification by faith alone. Right, because he, he, you know, Luther famously says that if anyone, if anyone could have saved his soul by monkery, it was me. Uh, you know, he would toss the blankets off at night. He would he would fast. He, he, he says, "I did all these things. If you could save yourself by being a monk, I would have been saved." Um, I think it has to do with this complex that he had from his dad. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's just remarkable. When you when you read Luther, he just comes across as a crazed man. <laughs> and, and and that's why and that's why one of his first opponents actually just translated his works and just said, hey, let, let's just translate this and see, see how people react because it's just so insane. But unfortunately, people were already insane and going wild, so they use it as a provocation. But but that I mean, when you read this, I remember reading. I I did a paper on this in in grad school mm. on this the Erasmus and Luther, right? And it's just like Erasmus just calmly. Yes, you know he very calmly <laughs> presents the case, and then Luther just spouts fire and just goes wild, and it's just like this guy's crazy. <laughs> it's hard yeah, to even, it's hard to take him seriously. Anyways, let, let's get yep. to a few more questions here. Sure. Uh, Bradley Cutler says, "I heard that Luther is worse than Hitler, Stalin, etc., because he killed souls, not bodies. Killed more souls than bodies, and is killing souls. Is this correct?" Well, of course, we we don't know. Uh, whether or not uh, Luther could have been, he could have been saved at the last minute, right? He could have repented. And so he could have had a very long purgatory. I mean, the same thing with, you know, Hitler and Stalin for that matter. Um, of course, it is a worse thing to kill souls than to kill bodies. Although often when you start affecting people's bodies, it, you, you, you lead them to be, to be worse than they were. And so you're actually killing souls also. But yeah, Luther has a lot to answer for. I mean, I, I wouldn't have, I, will, I, I don't want to be him. On, I've got my own sins to answer for on Judgment Day, but I wouldn't want to be him uh, because he, he was the spark that led millions of Catholics to abandon the faith. I mean, people have to understand the first Protestants to a man were all ex-Catholics. Uh, they, they might not have been, you know, deeply instructed in their Catholic faith, but still they, they were all baptized Catholics. Uh, and so, yeah, he's he's got a lot to answer for. Here's uh, another uh, comment by my friend Curtis. He says, Luther had intense scrupulosity. No matter how many times he confessed, he always felt guilty and from depraved, obsessive thoughts. Psychologists say he had OCD today. He talk about it, this scrupulosity. Yeah, it, it, again, uh, his confessor used to tell him, look, Luther, ease up. I mean, you don't have to complain about every little thing, okay? Uh, yeah, it, it seems that he was not 
he, it seems number, yeah, he, he had some psychological issues uh, and, and definitely OCD uh, and definitely scrupulosity. And unfortunately he took that and then went the, the complete opposite with it, right? Because then he said, yeah, you know, sin and sin boldly, but believe more boldly still. Or um, when, when I feel tempted by the devil, uh, and I, you know, when I'm in a near occasion of sin, it's better to drink, to dance, to be merry in spite of the devil. Uh, and he said, uh, if the 10 commandments upset you, you must put them as far away from you as possible. We, what he's got, a, he's got some juicy lines. He says, I will not have Moses and his law. And then he says, Moses must be hanged. We must hang Moses. And then he says, his best line is, I, I was going to save this for October 31st, but I can't help myself. He says, the Catholic theologians, they are jackasses. Be when they maintain that Christ only did away with the ceremonial aspects of the law and not also the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Christ. So Luther is saying that Christ did away with the Ten Commandments. You don't want to make a Moses out of him, do you? <laughs> uh, I'm really glad that you're doing it with this accent because that really <laughs> encapsulates. It really does. I mean, that's, and I haven't even given his quotes about the Jews. God help oh, us. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luther, Luther wrote a book called <laughs> Jesus was a Jew and it was hoping that he would convert a bunch of Jews, but then they didn't like it. They didn't convert. And so he wrote a <laughs> book against the Jews and their lies where he went on a tirade about how we should all go and burn all their synagogues and whatnot. Which is, if you watched uh, actually our first very first show together, Dr. Mazza showed how the Catholic position on the Jews would completely condemn that a, right. as a terrible abuse. And that's why it's so disturbing when, you know, the Vatican in recent years was honoring Luther in very strange ways. It's, it's very disturbing. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, let me see. Any other questions that we, we anybody else want to cover here? Um it's it's really quite um i mean this and just for viewers for especially cradle catholics who are not very familiar you've been blessed to not be familiar with protestantism i've been a protestant most of my life i converted to roman catholicism in 2013 so i i know protestantism and basically v the vast majority of protestants especially in the united states are what's called evangelicals and they do not read luther they don't read mm -hmm. calvin they don't they don't care about them at all actually they just read their bibles and think that they know they follow a vague movement called pietism from the 19th century which kind of decrease um de-emphasized doctrine mm -hmm. and so there's very few protestants who even actually read what luther said or tried to hold to him very few of them left the the as i said the new perspective on paul there's a, a movement among protestants which is called the great emergence or the emergent church, which is where all these Protestants are leaving all of these traditional denominations like uh, Lutheranism, Calvinism, Methodism, all this. And they're joining these big mega churches mm -hmm. and they're asking very good questions. And it's actually a positive movement because this is right. what, will, what will deliver them from their deception. And this is, this is precisely the movement I was a part of before I came to Catholicism. Wow. And so th this is, this is a very good thing because it, it's a, it's a massive movement among Protestants to come back to the Catholic church. It's the, it's the first step. So, uh, very good things happening. Um, well, even though they don't, yeah. you know, per se, they wouldn't know the teachings of Luther, they would still, you know, go by the Bible alone rather than following the church, for example, the Catholic church. Or, so, um, and that's another thing about Augustine very quickly. I could bring up is that St. Augustine also shot down sola scriptura. One time he was having a debate with his former Manichaeans, and of course, the Manichaeans believe that Mani was the paraclete that Jesus promised to the, to the apostles. Uh, you know, I will send you another paraclete or advocate, and he will teach you all truth. Well, uh, Mani claimed to sort of be the to be the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, so to speak. Um, and Augustine was arguing with them, and they said, "No, don't listen to the Catholic Church. Catholic Church doesn't know what it's talking about. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, you know, Jesus says, I'm going to send the paraclete. That was Mani." Uh, and Augustine says, wait a minute, guys, now, wait a minute here. Um, if you <laughs> if you try to convince me that the Catholic Church is wrong and the Bible is right, I'm going to have to give up the Bible. And the, his Manichaean opponent was like, what do you mean? I only believed in the Bible on the authority of the Catholic Church. 
But if you tell me that the Catholic Church doesn't know what it's talking about, it was the Catholic Church that put the Bible together. I'm not going to believe in the Bible anymore. That's going to be the end result. <laughs> yeah, that, and that goes into, um, let me see. Here's here's a question from Kevin. He says, how could I respond to a friend who believes since the Catholic Church has authority that it can be corrupted, we must become Protestant? That's a very good question because we are in a time yeah. of great corruption in the church. And well, so go ahead. St. Paul said that antichrists would come. St. Paul said that false shepherds would come. But that doesn't mean that we don't follow the, the true authority of the church. I'll give you a quick example. In the book of Acts, we read how certain Christians were going around saying that in order to be saved, um, you have to be circumcised. Now, I wonder where they got that idea, because that's actually a sola scriptura idea, <laughs> meaning at that time, <laughs> scriptura was the Old Testament, right? And these guys had no authority to be going around preaching that. They just, they just kind of did it, right? Because uh, at that time, most of the Catholics were, were Jews, I mean, ethnically, right, racially. So what did they? What did the what did the church do? The church held a council, the Council of Jerusalem, and at the Council of Jerusalem, who decides? Peter, James, the the you know the head, the apostles, the elders, they decide, and they say, you know what? It seemed good to us, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit here, not to lay on you any more burdens than X, Y, and Z. Right? Don't eat meats that have been sacrificed to idols, blah, blah, blah. But you don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So what does that demonstrate? That from the very beginning, the church has had living people who are the authority, not a book, right? Not The Old Testament, as good as it is, it could be misused, right? Or another quick example, Book of Acts. Uh, on Pentecost, uh, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 40, Acts 2, verse 40. It, it, it says that there are four qualities that all the baptized believers held to, right? Because that day, 3,000 people were baptized after Peter gave his sermon, right? Um, and it says that they dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of the bread, the fellowship, and the prayers. So if you're, if you're not a Catholic, the question you've got to ask yourself is, do, are you dedicated to the teaching of the apostles, the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, the fellowship and the prayers? I think most non-Catholics would only have the fellowship and the prayers. <laughs> but here's the thing. It, it says that they dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Now think for a moment. It meant they dedicated themselves to whatever these 12 guys said, right? Right. 12 living being human beings walking around because they replaced Judas with Matthias, right? So from the very beginning, the paradigm for Jesus's church has been, you've got a select group of guys with all the authority to teach, sanctify, and govern. And then the rest of the flock dedicated themselves to, to those people. When did that paradigm change so that now I go by the Bible alone? The paradigm didn't change until 1,500 years later. <laughs> so you, the pages of scripture itself tell us that they followed 12 living, breathing men. And when those guys, the, they weren't going to live forever because the Romans killed them all, except for St. John, although they tried. <laughs> the other men replaced them, just like they replaced Judas, right? So apostolic succession. In fact, you couldn't have a Bible if it wasn't for apostolic succession because Again, it's, it's the bishops who put the Bible together. It chose what books go in the Bible, what books don't go in the Bible. Here's another question. Ave Christus Rex says, Calvin said councils have authority unless they are, quote, obviously wrong, which I find funny. What did Luther think of councils? Yeah. Uh, now, Calvin, you know, Calvin, uh, from that quote, obviously believed in some authority with regard to councils, but Luther did not. Yeah, Luther... I, I think I, re I recall reading somewhere where Luther just went off, like, you know, don't talk to me about councils. Don't talk to me about this and that. It just, it's in, it's in scripture or it's not in scripture. He had that famous debate with um, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, right? At, at uh, uh, Marburg Castle, I think it was. And uh, Zwingli did not believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. But oddly enough, uh, Luther did. Uh, because obviously Luther was the first one to break away from the Catholic Church, so he held on to certain Catholic doctrines. For example, Luther believed that in justification by faith alone, but you get that faith ordinarily through baptism. 
So uh, Luther believed in the efficacy of baptism. He believed in uh, in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Now, he denied that a Catholic priest has anything to do with that, right? He he did not he denied that the, that the mass was a sacrifice. That's another thing we can talk about come October. But um, to answer the question more directly, Luther would not accept rational arguments because um, Zwingli tried to say, look, God, Jesus can't be at two places at the same time. So how can he be in the Eucharistic bread and sitting at the right hand of the Father? And Luther was like, don't give me these rational arguments. You know, um, he called, he called go, Aristotle go that, that bumbling buffoon. Because not only did he believe that we're that in the enslavement of the will, Luther believed that reason is intrinsically perverse. He he referred to reason as a whore, as a prostitute. Throw dung in her face, make her ugly like she is. It's a famous quote from Luther. <laughs> I'm so glad we're covering all these quotes. Uh, if if a, if a Protestant can watch this and just just read, I mean, the man is. It's cringe. He is it's cringeworthy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's. I, I think we've covered most of the question. That we didn't get into predestination because it, more than we did because it's such a large topic that can right. go on. There's actually a, uh, but Augustine is very important because there is a, there's also a Catholic heresy that happened in the Catholic Church after the Protestant Revol Reformation that had a massive impact called Jansenism. And we don't have time to cover this, but it's also sort of an Augustinianism, but not really following Augustine. It's, the not, church even a, and it's not even a Jansenism, although that's what it's called. Uh, apparently, Jansen himself, or Jansenus, uh, he died within the bosom of the church. Right, uh, yeah. And, and it's a long it's a story. Posthumous. yeah. Yeah. But that, that and they actually have a, a huge role to play in the French Revolution as a part of the whole movement that that arises. So it's a very important story. And part of that, the church actually never ruled on. There was a controversy called mm. De Auxilies that yes. the church just refused to to resolve, in fact. Yep. So it's a very uh, the, the, the story goes on, but we don't have time to go cover that. Maybe we'll get uh, Dr. Maza to grace us with his knowledge again and we'll we'll cover some more of Luther's craziness uh around the the so-called uh, reformation sunday um but uh everybody please go below once again uh support dr maza sign up for his courses uh dr maza any closing thoughts for the show yes again saint augustine is so important for us um i want to very quickly bring up his city of god you know in august of the year 410 barbarian visigoths sacked and pillaged and raped the city of Rome. And it was very psychologically devastating because it was the first time in 800 years that an enemy army had ever breached the imperial capital. And of course, people at the time uh, blamed uh, President Trump for it. No, I'm sorry. Um, the People at the time <laughs> blamed the Christians for that. And they said, look, we used to worship the old gods and now we've been worshiping Christ for the last hundred years. And you see what happens? And St. Augustine thundered back an answer, and it, it's considered his greatest work. It's called The City of God. And it's important for people right now because we're living in this COVID Chinese virus chaos right now, and everybody's filled with fear. And um, I'll, I'll tell you that St. Augustine's City of God even worked its way into a, a science fiction movie. You, you've seen the movie Signs, M. Night Shyamalan? Oh, yeah. What's, yeah. Where is that? Yeah. Uh, he plagiarized. I never met M. Night Shyamalan, but if I ever meet him, I'm going to say, you, man, you plagiarized St. Augustine's City of God. All right. The best scene in the movie is, is what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, the, the, every, they, they've been glued to the TV, listening to all this stuff about the aliens taking over the world, and everybody's filled with fear. It's kind of like today with, with COVID craziness. Um, and Mel Gibson uh, in the movie is, is playing a, an Eastern Rite priest who lost his wife and, and lost his faith as a result. And he's talking to Joaquin Phoenix on the sofa, uh, his brother, and the kids have just fallen asleep. And Joaquin Phoenix turns to him and says, you know, people think it's the end of the world. Do you think that's what this is? And Mel Gibson says, you know, it could be. And, and he says, can't you give me some comfort? And so as the older brother, he turns to Joaquin Phoenix and he says, people break down into two groups when they experience something lucky or they experience something unlucky. And he says, people in group number one, he says, they, they look at those 14 lights in the sky, those UFOs, and, and they know that whatever happens, 
someone up there is looking out for them and it's going to be okay. But the other people in group two, they're looking at those lights very suspiciously because they think they don't believe, they think everything's a coincidence. They think everything happens by chance. And that fills them with fear, right? Because if we can't get it done, we're, it's curtains, right? So what you got to ask yourself is, what kind of person are you? Are you a person who sees signs? Or let's put it this way. Could it be possible that there are no coincidences? And that's the punchline, right? So that's straight from the pages of St. Augustine. St. Augustine in the City of God says that there are two cities in the world. The, the, the city of the world and the city of God. And the people who live in the city of the world, they look to themselves. And it's built on self-love. And, you know, when, when Rome gets destroyed or there's some calamity, people panic and they're filled with fear because it's all on them. There is no God looking out for them. And if they can't get it done, then everybody's, you know, it's curtains. But the people who live in the city of God, they don't love themselves to the to, to the contempt of God. They have they have contempt for themselves out of love for God. And they lift up, and he quotes the Psalms. I, I lift up my heart to you, O Lord. And, and and Augustine understood this from his own personal life. Because, you know, when he was younger, he prayed that prayer. I, I said at the top of the show, Lord, grant me the gift of chastity, but not yet. But when he was an older man, when you read the confessions, he said that prayer, Lord, too late have I loved thee. Late have I loved thee, O oh, oh goodness, and, and O oh infinite goodness, right? He wished that he had loved God sooner in his life. So it's a message for us today. We should study St. Augustine. We should pray to St. Augustine because he told us, don't fall into the trap of just believing in yourself. You, we, we have to live in the city of God. And no matter how bad things get, there is still someone up there that's going to make good out of it. That is a perfect ending to this show. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mazza. Thanks for coming on the show. Make sure to check check out Dr. Mazza's website, www.edbinmazza.com. So let's offer up an Our Father for that very intention, Dr. Mazza, that that we can have the faith and a hope to place our trust in God in this difficult time, this insane COVID nineteen eighty four situation that we're in. And have confidence in the Lord. This this is a privilege that we have been given to live in this era where we can offer up the suffering and offer up our, our faith and hope and trust in God. Amen. So let's offer up an Our Father for that intention, for all your intentions, for my goddaughter, Amelia. Happy birthday. In the name of the Father, Father Son, Amen. Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit.